stand to our feet and welcome her as she comes to the stage this morning. Good morning. How's everyone doing today? So yes, my name is Jesse. If I have not met you before, I always laugh a little bit because we lead this church and I feel like I get to be here the least often <laughs> because of travel. Um, but I am so thankful that the Lord has given Parker and I a huge privilege um, that I never will ever complain about to travel around the world to preach the gospel. And I am very confused when ministers complain about ministry. <laughs> it's very confusing to me. I'm like, this is what you signed up for, right? Like you signed up to do this and this is what God anointed you to do. And so I, I always want to be grateful. And so I'm really excited. Um, what's funny is we sang it today. We sang the words, I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I didn't know we were going to sing that song. And uh, I would say that is the basis of my whole message today. And Parker gave me an out, which I will say he was like, it's Mother's Day. You can preach about whatever you want. And as a preacher, I have like 40 messages that I have practiced that I like feel good about. And I was like, okay, what are one of these like really killer messages that I could like pull out that no one's heard before? And I was like, well, where are you guys up to in scripture? Because as you guys know, with salt, we go chapter by chapter throughout the Bible. And Parker's like, we're in Romans 4. So I read through Romans 4, and I was like, I don't really want to preach Romans 4. And I was like, what about, right, just go to Romans 5. And Parker was like, well, you could do that because it's Mother's Day. But we are in Romans 4. And so I was like, okay. So I was like, I have two outs. I can either preach another message I've written before, or I could just skip to Romans 5 and have Parker do Romans 4 next week, or I could wrestle with Romans 4. And I found myself super frustrated as I was reading it. So much so where I, like Parker said, I'm a verbal processor. Any other verbal processors in the room? I think verbal processing is actually super healthy. <laughs> I think it's better than being like a psychopath that starts shooting people down because you just hadn't talked to someone about how you're feeling. <laughs> so I'm like, sometimes you need to just tell people like, can we get a coffee and talk about our feelings for five minutes? And so I, I am a processor and I said to Parker, I was like, can we just talk for a second about Romans 4? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, honestly, I'm really struggling with this because there are some pretty bold statements in here. And if these things are true, which I believe that the word of God is true, I feel like this really changes Christianity for most people. And Parker's like, yeah, that's probably true. And I was like, no, I don't like that. Like, I am really struggling with this. And I started to get mad. And he was like, stop getting mad. I'm not going to talk to you about this if you keep getting mad. And I was like, I'm not getting mad. I'm just trying to understand because I'm getting kind of upset, but I'm not mad. And... And so I will say I've wrestled through this, and I believe that the revelation through this wrestle will actually shift how your Christian experience is going thus far. And so I am nervous for you as well as excited, but I believe that this is a transformative revelation, um, if you will so let it be. Um, but what's sometimes hard about the word of God is, is we can build a whole mindset around our beliefs, around what we even think the Lord wants. That's just not true. And I found myself coming into that wrestle with Romans 4. And so I'm just going to pray for you. And I actually want to pray what we sang earlier, that we would build our life upon his love because it actually is a firm foundation. Jesus, I thank you that our plans and our ways, that they're not a firm foundation. I can feel in this room that there are many of you that are building your life not on his love. 
and it's creating anxiety, it's creating tension, it's creating stress, and it's because the sand is withering, it's falling, it's falling apart, and you're thinking that you built it on the Lord's love, but you've built it on your own ideas. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would speak to us, that you would give us revelation through your word, and you would help us to understand what it is that you've actually given to us and how to actually build a life on a firm foundation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, um, I... I'm very interested in like the early pioneer age of America. I actually think it's one of the most interesting times in America's history. Um, I, I think it's like part of the American spirit, right? Like America is entrepreneurial. We're creative. We're kind of rebels a little bit. I'm like, our nation was kind of like formed out of just like not wanting to do what the monarchs are telling us to do. And we were like, eh, you know what? We're going to actually do it this way, create our own government. And, you know, like they wanted to tax us to death. And we like threw all the tea into the water, like just really crazy stuff. And I love that about the American spirit. And one of the things I pray for our country all the time is that we would not lose that American spirit, right? And so I love watching movies like Far and Away and shows like 1883 and like Yellowstone. I know whatever, it's controversial, but I love it because I love the grittiness of the American spirit, right? And you know, when you watch those old movies of the pioneers, like, going across the country, it was all based on a promise. Most of them had never even seen the West Coast. They were just hearing rumors of the possibilities of what was on the West Coast. So we know, if we've, any, any of us have ever been to school, we know that there was the 13 original colonies. So California and Washington were not part of that. And as we pioneered and risked all for a hope and a dream, we actually, that's how the United States became a nation, by us actually going into distances that we knew nothing about. Many people died. If anyone played the Oregon Trail game <laughs> when they were younger, you're like, oh, smallpox or like falling carriages. It was like anything could take people out at that point. But they did it. Why? Because there was a hope right? That there was something on the other side of that risk, right? And so a lot of times people would sell everything to go to the West Coast to pioneer. And I believe that prophetically our nation right now is in an era time. And it's not just this church. I believe it is the whole nation. The Lord is reestablishing that pioneer spirit. That's why so many people are in transition. But what happens is the deceiver, the enemy, he tries to bait us and make us feel like we're victims when we're pioneering. Right? And so what happens is when they went to the coast, you know, has anyone heard of the great gold rush? Right? They were literally fighting one another to get to the hills first to strike gold. And when they would strike gold, here's what they would say. They would say a word, and the word was Eureka. And they would scream out as loud as they could, Eureka, which means I have found what I'm looking for. They're like, I lost my family. I lost all my possessions. I lost everything along the way. But they hit something. They struck something, and they go, Eureka, Eureka. I found what I'm looking for. They're screaming to everyone around. I found it. I found it. I found it. And I'm like, this is like the moment of salvation that many of us have experienced, right? We're, we're giving up everything. Our lives are not working. It feels like we're in this uphill battle. And then all of a sudden, we have an encounter with God. We experience his real presence, his real love. We get healing. We get deliverance. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh. <gasps> This is it. Like, I found it. I found what it is that I'm looking for. It's that, like, oh, aha moment. And I think that every single believer needs to have that moment. If you don't have that moment and you're 
relationship with Jesus is established on good doctrine, good Christian behavior, and someone else's eureka movement, I think you just get swirled into a downward spiral. You forget what it was like to be saved because you never had that aha moment, right? But I believe that God is inviting all of us again. So what revival is, I believe the reason why we're seeing revival throughout the nation is it's us reminding ourselves through the power of the Holy Spirit, ah, I found what I'm looking for. Oh my gosh, I've been so deceived. I've been swiping social media all day long thinking that my life is dull, doing linear comparison to every single person around me, thinking that my life is mundane and boring. And the reason why I need revival is I need to remember that I discovered what it is I'm looking for, right? And so that's why we pray for revival. That's why we sacrifice for revival, because what this nation needs is a eureka moment, right? We need the church, which is most of this nation statistically, to have that moment where they go, whoa, I found what it is I'm looking for, right? And that's why, we, that's why evangelism is easy. Evangelism, it's not trying to muster up this, like, good story. What it is is saying, I found what I'm looking for. There's gold over here. I know you gave up everything, so come where there's gold, so here's the thing, though, about pioneers, and here's the thing for probably every person in this room, including myself. So has anyone ever heard about stones of remembrance? It's a thing that was part of the Old Testament. Basically, as they would go, they would establish these rocks, literally, like physical rocks. And they would put these rocks there so that any time they passed by there again, they would remember what the Lord did. Okay, now here's the thing. I think that the bait or the promise for all of us is a saying called, remember when. So some of us get into this trap where we go, look at everything I let go of. Look at everything I left. Remember when we had all of these finances. Remember when we had all of these friends. Remember when we had health insurance. Remember when <laughs> we had X, Y, and Z, right? We all have those things. And we could look back at the things that the Lord told us to leave and it can make us a victim where we go, remember when, how good that was. And that stone of remembrance can become your own stumbling block. Instead of being like, remember when I was totally bound by depression and the Lord set me free? Remember when I was serving at a church that I hated and I complained every Sunday? And then all of a sudden, the Lord told me to sacrifice everything and move to actually be a part of a body that brings me life. Remember when I had no finances and I was totally afraid of money and the Lord made me a generous person that no longer feared finance but became a provider for other people. Remember when? And then those stones of remembrance, right, they actually testify to the other people that are coming in the same direction, right? But as Christians, we can either declare glamorization of our past or we can prophesy about what the Lord's done and he's going to do in the future, right? And so this whole message is about faith. And the reason why it's about faith is because many of us, I, I think, myself included, have a misunderstanding of faith and a misunderstanding of the call that the Lord actually has for us. So Romans 4, verse 1 through 3, if you have your Bibles, you can open it up. Parker was laughing this morning because my marker in my Bible right now is a throw-up bag from an airplane because I'm pregnant <laughs> And I'm always afraid that I'm going to throw up while preaching. <laughs> so I keep this in my, <laughs> my Bible in case I have to throw up. 
So, <laughs> just a funny thing. Anyway, welcome to my life. Um, I said to Parker when we were preaching in Houston, I was like, if I say, Parker has a word for you, just grab the microphone and I'm running off stage. <laughs> but anyway, so, um, so Romans 4 verse 1. So this is right off the bat. It says this. It says, what then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? It says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So I know that Pastor Rick spoke to you guys about righteousness last week, but I know for me, I needed to get a, a better grasp of that. Um, because I was like, okay, Abraham believes in God, and because he believes in God, the Lord says, righteous. He's righteous. And I think we all have that same invitation through faith. So here's the thing. It's a weird concept if you understand this, because every single one of us through the Holy Spirit is given faith. So none of you manufacture faith. If you believe in Jesus, you've been given the faith to even believe in him to begin with. So that's why we know salvation is not by our own works, but by faith alone, right? So it's like you literally can't even get yourself to believe in God. I know it. like this is where I wrestle because I'm like, I'm a hard worker. <laughs> I like to like get stuff done. And I'm like, my ability to like believe in Jesus is like not even my own ability. Like, can I just be honest? I'm like, that kind of like sucks a little. Like I'm like, so I feel like I'm a person of great faith, which means that the Holy Spirit just gave me that great faith. He just gave me the ability to believe in him. And then says that I'm righteous because I did what he's doing. It, like, takes off a lot of pressure, which, to be honest, I like a little pressure, <laughs> right? I grew up in a home, like, work hard, play hard, and then work really hard again, right? And so it feels like this weird paradigm shift, right? And so righteousness is justification, it says in Strong's Concordance, in a broad sense, it's the state of him who is as he ought to be. So it's literally you becoming the person that you were meant to be from the foundation of the earth. Okay? So literally by faith, you become the person God wants you to become. Okay? And then ready for this? It's becoming the condition acceptable to God. So without faith in him, you cannot be acceptable to God. So when we get saved, the word soteria, there's a three-step process. It's salvation, which we all just get hung up on that one thing. That's like a huge disservice in the body of Christ, right? Everyone, it like hinges everything just on salvation, just on that one, like, okay, I am sanctified, which means that I'm going to heaven, right? And most of Christianity is powerless in America because all we think about is like, whew, I'm dying and I'm going to heaven, right? I always hear arguments all the time when it comes to baptism. People are like, what about the thief on the cross? I'm like, the thief on the cross didn't need to be baptized because he died on the cross. So we need to be baptized to be born again for this life, right? We need to be justified in this life. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit in this life, right? There's a reason why when you make a decision to follow Jesus, you're not just like teleported right into heaven because you actually have work to do here on this earth, right? So you're given the Holy Spirit so that you can go through the process of sanctification. That means every year when you look back on your life, your life, you should look more like Jesus this year than last year. And if you're not, then you should do a self-check 
and say, what's going wrong? Because every year you should be transformed by glory to glory and looking more like him every year. Now, some people, they're with, they want a one-day microwave process. <laughs> They're like, listen, I got baptized. I should look like the resurrected Savior today. And I'm like, no, no, sanctification is a process, right? It's as that addiction to sin is removed from you and you consecrate your life for Jesus, you're transformed into his image, right? But then we forget all about justification, which is another part of salvation. So we don't preach about justification a lot in church. We're like, who wants to be justified before Lord? We're like, no, we want to be saved of our sins, right? We want to feel better about what we did last week, right? But justification means that the Lord can look at us and say, you're worthy to be in my presence. Okay, so righteousness, that's why it says our self-righteousness is like filthy rags, right? Which means menstrual rags. That's what it's saying. It's, it's unclean. It's, 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 it's disgusting to the Lord. Actually, even to another level, which people are not going to like this, but literally they would say that it was unclean, meaning the spirit of Tuma, which means the spirit of death, which means your self-righteousness looks like the spirit of death to Jesus. Isn't that crazy? You trying to do it in your own strength looks like death to Jesus. Why? Because faith alone in him and what he has promised you. Okay, so it's not just faith in Jesus dying for you and raising from the dead. It's also faith, and this is, this is the hard word. It's also faith in every promise He's given you. So it's not just believing in him, but part of that justification process is believing in the words that he gave to you. Okay, so here's where it gets a little tricky, and this is where I wrestle a lot. Okay, so here's the thing. So many of us, we live in a day and age where a lot of us have gotten a lot of encouraging words, a lot of prophetic words, a lot of promises. The Bible is filled with thousands of promises. And I almost feel like we have prophecy promise overload. And we, it's almost like there's too much data, so we don't put all of our eggs in any basket. So we just want God to just do a lot and nothing specific. And I would encourage you today, one of your main takeaways for today is pick one promise this year. Pick one prophetic word. Put all of your faith in that one thing coming to pass. Because so many times we can go to conferences, we can go to events, we can get prayer, and we're intaking, we're taking in so much, and then the next week we're not even remembering the word that was given to us. Right? And so that is actually filthy rags to the Lord. Because it, it's just death, it dies. The word dies. It falls to the ground and it dies. Right? Some of you have gotten prophetic words to move here or prophetic words about why you live here or prophetic words about this nation. So every day, are you going into the place of prayer saying, Lord, will this be? How will this be? Show me. If I don't know how you're going to do this, I am going to be hopeless. I need you to move in this. I need you to move through me. I will not partner with hopelessness. I will only partner with faith because it's in faith alone that I'm counted righteous. But so many times what we do instead is we forget the prophetic words, we forget the word of God, and instead what we try to do is just do a lot in our own strength. Right? I am number one guilty of this. Right? And I'm like, okay, if I just like work harder and do more, it's just going to happen. And you get frustrated, you hit walls, you get frustrated with the people around you, right? And so it says this, Genesis 15. So I'm going to talk about um, 
Abraham and his belief in God and it being credited to him as righteousness. So Genesis 15 says this. This is the story. It's Abraham before he's Abraham. And this is when the Lord gives him that promise. So has anyone in the room ever gotten a promise from God? Wave your hand. If you have not, please come up to the front after the end of the service, and we would love to pray for you. Because here's the thing. If you do not have a promise from the Lord, you will be taken out by the enemy. And I'm saying it that boldly and that clearly because you will be tossed to and fro because the cares in this world will outweigh your devotion for the Lord because we actually need to put all of our trust in him. And that's why knowing the word of God and knowing his word over your life, every single one of you have a specific job to do on this earth. Every single one of you have something that you're supposed to fulfill and accomplish on this earth. But if you don't know what that is, you're like a chicken wandering around without its head chopped on, cut, cut off. And you're wandering around like this and you're like, I love Jesus, I love Jesus, I love Jesus. And you're accomplishing nothing and creating chaos around you because there's no direct direction, right? So like we see in Moses, it's like he needed to have a word from the Lord to get the people out of Egypt, right? We see throughout scripture, you need a word from the Lord so that you can step out in faith, right? So it says this, Genesis 15, verse 1, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham, how? In a vision, in a vision, so there are many ways that the Lord can speak to you. Some of you may hear the Lord in dreams. Some of you might get a prophetic word. Some of you might watch a movie. And all of a sudden, it touches your heart a little differently. And you're like, I don't know why I'm crying right now, but this feels like it's really resonating with me. That is called the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is so smart and so awesome that what he'll do is he'll use everything around you. It says all of creation groans, right? It's like everything around you is beckoning you into who you are and who you're called to be, right? We just need to have eyes that are lifted and hearts that believe, right? So, so many of us, we use our faith on the wrong things, right? We, we get into those stones of remembrance of how much better it was and how much better it used to be. And we put all of our faith and all of our time thinking about all the things that we sacrificed and let go of instead of having eyes that are pressed forward to what he's doing and he's about to do. So it says this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, which means his eyes were closed or open, and he saw something like a movie playing in front of him. So some of you have visions all the time, and you attribute it to your imagination. And I'm here to tell you, you're not as creative as you think you are. The Lord is most often trying to speak to you. And he says, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. So first things first, he establishes his relationship with Abraham before the promise. Many of you want promises from Lord before you have the relationship. So first what you need to do is get a vision of what the Lord thinks about you and who he is, is to you. You know, I love Psalm 91. It's like when I feel really stressed out, sometimes I need to think that the Lord is my shelter, right? And when I feel really overwhelmed with stuff, with saturate or with ministry or with finances, literally I picture myself coming under the shelter of the Most High. And for me, that's my vision of who the Lord is for me. He is my hiding place, which means sometimes I need to get away from all of you guys. Because it's overwhelming to me. 
Because sometimes ministry is hard. And the, the apathy in the nation is overwhelming to me. And I'm like, how do I get them to care? Why does no one care? Why does everyone lie about what they say they're going to do for the Lord? And then they don't do it. it. It makes me weep. And the Lord says, come, come and hide in me. I am your resting place. I am your secret place. So before I can get vision for revival, I need to have a vision of who the Lord is to me. Right? So it says, I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. He says, This man will not be your heir. But a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. Then he took him outside. That's why I love doing church outside. Because <laughs> sometimes I'm like, sometimes you need to just see something besides four walls. <laughs> right? When I feel really bummed, I'm like, I just need to go to the beach and look at the ocean and chill. <laughs> he took him outside and said, look up at the sky. Right? Again, he gives him a second vision. Right? One vision is in the supernatural. The other is in the natural. Right? So God will speak to you in a myriad of ways. Sometimes in a dream. And then other times he'll say, look at this right in front of your face. Right? So he says, look up at the sky. He's like, because what I'm about to show you, you'll doubt it if it's in your imagination. So he says, look up at the sky. Okay, so we can all see the sky with all the stars. And he says, count the stars, if indeed you can count them. I don't know if you've ever tried to count stars. It's impossible. <laughs> and he said to him, so shall your offspring be. He's like, see all these stars? That's your inheritance. Right? And then it says, Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it to him. As righteousness. He became justified in that moment, not before and not after. It wasn't when the promise came, and it wasn't when he took everyone out of the nations and went to exile. That wasn't the thing. It wasn't the bold step of leaving the nation and sacrificing everything. There's a temptation that we can have in radical Christianity where we think our one sacrifice or our one radical generous gift is enough to get us by for the rest of our life. And the temptation there is we don't then live by faith. We live by that one time we were faithful. Right? So I know all the time the Lord keeps saying to me, Jesse Green, the faith that you had in 2019 for revival on the beaches in California, that level of faith will not take you into what I have for you. And I find myself again at chapter one where I'm like, oh, I feel like I have no faith again. I feel like everything, I feel like I'm starting all over again. And the Lord's like, good. That's a great place to be because what you did before was great. But now I need you to do a new thing, which requires new faith, right? So sometimes we could be like, but I've sold all my belongings four times already. I've moved across the country three times. Lord, look at what I've done. And he says, don't care about that. Filthy rags. He says, what makes you righteous is your continued faith in me. Today, not yesterday. Right? Okay, so faith is, a lot of times we use the word faith and people are like, what actually is that? It means absolute persuasion. Wow. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he fully convinces you. Right? So if you are not fully convinced of the promise, then that's an invitation from the Lord to spend time in his presence until you are fully convinced. Right? So sometimes 
myself included, I find myself needing to get away from social media, needing to get away from friends and family because I need to become fully convinced by the Holy Spirit. Because we even know in the story of Abraham, he was a man full of faith, and then his lovely wife kind of persuaded him out of that faith. Right? right. right? And there are people sometimes that are the closest to you that will not have the word of the Lord for your life. Right. That's right. And we can allow their faithlessness to rob us of the faith that we've worked so hard to strengthen. And so the only place where you can strengthen that faith is in time, in his presence, and in the word of God. Okay? And so faith is when we have full persuasion, full reliance upon Christ. You know, it says some of us have the gift of faith, which means like all spiritual gifts, like the gift of healing, literally you can have a gift given to you where there are people in this church and other churches around the nation where literally they have the Holy Spirit gift of faith and they just believe for impossible things no matter what. Those people are horrible, annoying people to be around. <laughs> because what happens is, is when you say impossible, they say, how do you not see? Do you not see? Do you not perceive? This is not impossible. It's an invitation to believe. Good. Right? I believe that the biggest issue in our nation right now is not, I'm going to, Parker's going to maybe disagree with me on this. It's not necessarily the LGBTQ. It's not the progressive Christianity. It's not the moral decline. I actually don't think those are the biggest issues in the American church. I believe the biggest issue we face in this church and the church at large is an issue of hopelessness. We have become people that are faithless. You know... It says in Proverbs 13, 12, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Yeah. When it says deferred, what it means is to drag out. Wow. It's when you're hoping for something and it feels like it's not coming to pass. And the word heart sick, it doesn't just mean like, oh, I'm sad, I'm heart sick. It means like physically it makes you feel sick, right? What do we have as the biggest issues in our nation? Depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, right? I believe all of those are symptoms of hope deferred. It's literally heart sickness, right? We are lacking, we are lacking hope in our nation. You may be lacking hope in your own situation, Right? But then it says this on the ends of Proverbs 13, 12. It says, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Right? So when that promise comes to pass, right, all of a sudden it's like the best thing ever. Eureka! I found what it is I'm looking for. Right? Like how many of you have ever gotten a breakthrough before that you've been really contending for? It's like, whoo, thank you, Jesus. It worked. I made it through. But the problem with that is, I know, you're like, another problem? I thought this was the tree of life. The problem is, is when we have access to the tree of life, like Adam and Eve, what could happen is, is we start to look at the other trees in the garden. Yeah. And all of a sudden, instead of celebrating and enjoying what the Lord has done, right, we've gotten really bad at the discipline of celebration in the Christian church. The Jewish culture has maintained this, but we don't know how to throw a party anymore, right? We fight, we decree, we go to war, but where's the disco balls? Where is the confetti? Like, where is the fun when we celebrate what the Lord has done, right? Like the church sometimes is just sad all the time. Where are the celebrations of the Lord breaking through for the family? For the barren woman who gets pregnant, where's the party? 
right? For the hundreds in this tent already who have been delivered of demonic spirits. Where's the confetti? You clap, but yet there's no confetti. And the reason why is, is because we have not yet trained ourselves in the discipline of celebration because we want to get right back in to hope deferred. Right? We're like, that was great. The baptisms were great. This was great. But now we got to think about next month and the trials of next month. And now we got to think about the next hard thing in front of us and the next bills I got to pay. I'm not going to think about the fact that the Lord just paid all my bills and throw a party. Instead, I'm going to stress out about what's coming up next. And then all of a sudden we feel heart sick again and we get into this spiral and we're like, remember when I didn't have to worry about such things? Wow. That's really good. And so yeah. I believe that it is in waiting where we grow in faith. Mm-hmm. It is only in this place and opportunity where we can be counted as righteous. Some of you have hope deferred, and I say praise God. Because this is the opportunity where the Lord is counting you as righteous if you will choose to believe him instead of being a negative Nancy. If you want to be counted as righteous, if there is a delay on your promise, that's the chance, that's the time that you grow in faith. It doesn't come any other way. When it's all working out, you don't need faith. Right? Right? So when there's that delay, all of a sudden, that's when we get to say, praise God, I am being counted as righteous. Without this delay, I couldn't be. Because it would require no faith whatsoever. If the Lord just was a genie in a bottle and did whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted, it would require zero faith. And you'd probably become a horrible person. But it says this. Romans 1, 17. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written. How do the righteous live? They will live by faith faith. They don't live by promise to promise. Listen, there's a reason why Christians are called what? We are believers. Why are we called believers and not achievers? When you make a decision to follow Jesus, we're not like, welcome achiever. We're called believers. Why? Because the primary job of a Christian is is to believe what's counted to you as righteousness is not what you achieve isn't that crazy but and i know this was my wrestle i was like but faith without works is dead right all the achievers said amen right we're like lazy bones over there Right? That's just shaking in a corner back and forth and praying and contending but not doing anything. Right? You're like, what about the work of faith? But here's the thing. What's counted to you as righteousness, what the Lord sees, is if you just believe in him, whether it happens or not. Moses never enters the promised land. Counted as righteous, a general of the faith. Don't like that. (laughs) Abraham never sees his descendants like stars in the sky. He sees one descendant. And is even tested in the faith to lay down his son as a sacrifice. Right? We know the story. He lays down his son. Right? So not only does the Lord come to pass and bring the promise, right? But then he's tested to see if he's really a man of faith because his faith is so important. It's not important if he actually has the son and if the generations actually come. The Lord's like, yeah, that actually doesn't even matter to me because that's my promise. And the promises of the Lord never fail. So that's why it's not counted to you as righteous because you're not doing it. (laughs) 
So the only thing he cares about is, do you trust him? Do you trust him? I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. We see a nation, our nation, shaken, the church shaken. Why? Because we have built a firm foundation not on our trust in God, but on our own programs, our own theology, our own doctrine, our own cultural wars, and not on the promises of the Lord, even if they don't come to pass. Will you die on the hill that you believe him anyway? Let's say he promises you 10,000 acres and you go throughout your life believing this promise and you're on your deathbed and you don't have a lease in front of you. You don't have an agreement to buy that land. Will you be on your deathbed and say, I believe? Because you have an understanding that his promises will come to pass, whether in your lifetime or the next. Yeah, that's so good. It says this. Hebrews 11, many of us know this, but we don't have the revelation of it. It says, now faith, faith is confidence in what we hope for. Right, So the solution for a pandemic of hopelessness is faith, right. right? Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see, right? That means no matter what you experience, this is hard for our mindset, no matter what you experience, it's the guarantee that's what faith is. That's why we're believers. We believe in him despite all things. And it says, this is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Literally, water, the earth, stars, the sky, like we believe that the Lord just created those things. And yet we have so many promises over our own lives and we're like, God doesn't know what he's doing. He's not gonna make this come to pass. I need to hustle and make this work. You don't know how to even make a star, one star. You literally can't make one. And yet you're trying to run your business your way. And yet we can't even create anything out of nothing. Wow. <laughs> Hebrews 11, 13 through 16 talks about the generals of the faith. It says all these people were still living by faith when they died. Moses, Abraham, they did not receive the things promised. Guys, they never got it. They never actually got the thing that was promised to them. How's that for an encouraging Mother's Day message? Yeah. <laughs> right? We live in a Christianity where it's like, if we don't get the promise in a year, right. we're like, God, why have you forsaken me? I think I'm going to do new age now because at least they get this stuff really quick. <laughs> Even if it's demonic powers giving it to them, it's better to have something than nothing, right? Right? And we don't think we do that in the American church. We do. It's called praying your own will. Right? It's the same thing. It's witchcraft. It's doing things your way. Right? It says, they did not receive the things they promised. Ready for this? They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. Talk about vision, right? They could see it coming, even if it wasn't in their lifetime. Admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. The revelation that this is not the most important thing. That's right. right? It says, people who say such things show that they're looking for a country of their own. If they had been looking 
If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return again. If you think that this is the most important thing, you will constantly be looking back like Lot's wife. I believe Lot's wife was turned into a pillar of salt because she could never be the salt of the earth. Because when you're constantly stuck looking in the past, you can never change and be a catalyst for what's ahead. Yeah, that's so true. Right? We've all experienced those people, right? You're like, please stop talking about how good your life was 10 years ago. We know it wasn't, and no one cares. Right? Because what he's doing is far greater. Right? Right? And it says this, if they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have an opportunity to return. Instead, they were not looking and longing for a better country, but a heavenly one. That's so, so good. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Wow. <sighs> for he has prepared a city for them. Yeah. What an amazing promise that God would prepare a city for you. Smith Wigglesworth once wrote, he says, when the spirit of the Lord is upon us, we impart not words, but life. Words are only that you may understand what the word is, but the word is really life-giving. So when we are covered with the spirit, we are imparting life. If you are ready to receive it, it is amazing how it will quicken your mortal body every time you touch this life. It is a divine life. It is the life of the son of God. Romans 4, 17 says, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. When you feel hopeless, your primary job is to hold firm to the author of life, right? It's not to do it, don't, don't fake it till you make it, don't hustle till you die. What you're supposed to do is hold firm into those promises and say, even if I don't see it in this lifetime, I believe that the Lord's word will come to pass. And when people are around me, what they're going to hear about is my trust in the Lord, in him alone, and not about the hard trials, not about the suffering. Rick, if you want to come up, because Romans 5, 1 through 5, which Someone's going to preach next week. (laughs) It says this. Okay. And this is going to be the spoiler alert for one of the best chapters in the whole Bible that I don't get to preach, Romans 5. (laughs) It says this, though. All of this is... What I love about Romans is it builds. Right? It shows us the human condition, the problem, why we need a savior, right? And at just the right time, he comes. He saves us. We believe in him. We are given this gift of faith, right? And then it just like keeps building, right? Like you go through Romans 6 through 11 and you're like, I cannot believe the life that's offered to me. Right? That you don't have to be a slave to sin anymore. You can literally live free of sin, which is a guaranteed promise in Romans. Right? Are those the things that you put your faith in? Literally, do you every single day say, Lord, make me a sinless person. Mm. Yeah. Transform my life to be more like Christ today. Yeah. How can I look more like you? How can I be a believing believer that believes you, that does and creates things from nothing? Yeah. Right? Some of you have a lot and some of you have nothing. And what you need is God to create something, right? And so what it says is in Romans 5, 1 through 5, one of my favorite verses, it says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, okay, so it's like given, given, you're going to be made righteous through faith because if you're in part of this Romans church, if you're an early believer, then we're just going to go ahead and assume that you're putting all your faith in God. Right, the assumption of the early church was that they believed. 
right? You know, we, we, I love the story of when, um, forgetting their names, Priscilla, not, not Priscilla, Nicola, people that were killed with the offering. And I is fire. I'm like, I love the fact that they were killed in their offering. <laughs> because here's the thing, what they did was, this is what revival looks like. I know we pray for these things, but they sold everything, right? And we would say, wow, what a huge sacrifice. But what they did was they held back a little bit for themselves, which means that they didn't have 100% faith. And there was such an intolerance of 90% faith in the early church that the Holy Spirit was like, I can't let this disease of hopelessness wow. spread through the early church that it'd be better if I just killed them. Wow. It scares me how much the Holy Spirit has allowed hopelessness to be in the church of America. Wow. Yeah. I don't know why half of us are not stricken dead. Because it is a disease, hopelessness. Because what happens is, is when we don't see the Lord do something, we start to spread the rumors of, uh, I don't know if I really believe that about God. Do you think really healing happens for today? And we get all these weird doctrines around our nation, right? So here it's saying, assuming, therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, right? So justification through faith is the cure for anxiety. I'm just gonna say that if you're struggling with anxiety, be justified through faith, right? We're trying to come up with all these gimmicks and it says, no, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ when we trust in him, right? What anxiety is, is it's you trying to do something in your own strength. Right, right. So it's making you anxious because you're not supposed to do that. Right. It says, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, right. right? We don't like to suffer, but we do love to suffer when we understand that it's helping us. It's helping strengthen the more important thing. What's more important than you getting your wish list this year is you having faith. Maybe the Lord is stripping things away from you to give you faith. Maybe things are harder this year than they were last year because he's trying to grow your faith. Because what you started to do was you started to rely on yourself again. You started to rely on your own budget and your own calendar and your own strategies and your own ways that it worked last year. Friend, it's not gonna work that way this year. Why? Because he requires faith. And so it says we understand that the suffering because knowing that it produces perseverance and perseverance creates character and character creates hope. Hope, that feels like a weird next thing. It does, right? I would think it makes you like, produces strength <laughs> or joy, <laughs> right? No, it produces hope. Why? Because when you trust in him while you're suffering, and when you trust in him while he's developing your character, what starts to happen is, is no matter what happens, you still have hope. And you don't become someone that's hope deferred and heart sick. You're not someone that is worried or anxious because you've gone through suffering, you've built up character, and you've built up the strength that no matter what you see around you, your faith is in Him. And no one or no thing or nothing in the economy, 
Nothing in legislation can sway you of that hope. Right? So many of us are tossed to and fro because we have not built a firm foundation where he is the cornerstone. It says, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love. Why will you not be not put to shame? Okay, Moses never makes it to the promised land, and yet we still count Moses as one of the best people in all of Scripture, right? All of the Jews, they think Moses is the best. He never makes it into the promised land. Why is he the best? Because his hope in the Lord, his faith, doesn't put Moses to shame throughout history. It says because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So close your eyes and let me pray for you. Jesus, I thank you right now that you are infusing into us an unshakable faith. God, I ask for forgiveness right now when we try to do things in our own strength on this mother's day let this be a day of remembrance that we don't even know how to create a life in the womb let that be a reminder that our own flesh and blood we don't know how it was invisible and then all of a sudden we are let us look into the mirror and see the author and the finisher of our faith that we don't know how to create hair or nails on our hands or eyes for the body. And so we don't know how it is that you're gonna do the things that you've promised, Lord. But we know that your word is finished and that you will accomplish what it is that you set to accomplish, God. So Holy Spirit, right now, I ask for you to increase faith. And we command right now all hopelessness to leave our physical bodies now in Jesus' name and help us to see visions, to have dreams, to know the word of the Lord, to spend time in your presence, God, to be around believing believers. Let us edify one another. Let us prophesy over one another. It says that prophecy is good because it builds up the church because we need to build up one another, not in what's impossible, not into the economy that's coming, not in fear, Lord, but let us build one another up with faithful endurance that we will finish the race that is set before us. And I command right now our eyes to stop looking back, but to be set forward now in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, I thank you that this church is a church of Eureka. I have found what it is that I am looking for. So Holy Spirit, let us be bold. Let us not be ashamed. Let us not play church politics, God. But let us say that we have found in a blueberry field a place where we can be full of faith and full of hope despite all things. And Jesus, I thank you what you're doing across the earth, that you are multiplying your spirit, that you are pouring out vision, you are pouring out dreams, that your old men will have dreams and visions and your young men will prophesy God. So let it be so. Let this be one nation under God. Again, we believe it. We cannot afford to disbelieve in Jesus name and everyone said amen 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 amen, amen.